Let's give your attention to Christy Woolsey. Thank you, Christy. Thank you. All right. Um, everybody ready to learn something? Yeah. Everybody ready to learn something? Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I spent the first 12 years of my adult career as a professor um, studying the impact of the physical environment on human behavior. And I've been told that sometimes I get a little professor-ish in these talks. I will try not to do that. And it is not first period, so I expect none of you to be sleeping. So I am a behavioral strategist. What the heck is that? I, uh, what I do, I used to do original research. Now I call myself a research aggregator. Uh, basically, the, the research in the specific area that applies to workplace is really in its infancy. Um, and so what I do is I go look at behavioral research in the area of, well, primarily retail and prisons, uh, because there's a lot of retail research there that does actually apply to the workplace. So um, for those of you that are familiar with the iconic sayings of architecture, you will recognize this. Uh, the phrase was first written as form ever follows function by the famous architect Louis Sullivan, who, was, uh, who wrote an article in 1896 about uh, the, uh, the appropriate aesthetics for tall buildings. Um, and it was shortened to form follows functions by the, um, by the era of modernist architects, um, which was really, it became a, a battle cry that really talked about the fact that aesthetics should come from uh, the actual function of a building or a structure of an object. Now, form follows function was a great rallying cry in an era that began with the um, uh, with, that began with mass production and really became focused on the development and creation of beautiful objects and the mass production of those beautiful objects. Um, but this is a different era. And so, what I want to do to, with you today is to move you from thinking about objects to thinking about experiences. There was a book written about 15 years ago ahead of its time called The Experience Economy. And it's really become the uh, rallying cry of uh, retail and restaurants. If you aren't branding yourself through your experience, you are failing. And slowly but surely, businesses are realizing that designing the experience for their customers and employees is what matters, not designing the object. So I want to move again. I want to move your focus from your buildings, your desks, your tables into the experience. And how do we get to experience? Well, the best way to get to experience is to really think about what human behavior, um, what, how you can tag on to natural human behavior patterns. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about behavioral norms. There are two kinds of behavioral norms, formal behavioral norms and informal behavioral norms. Formal behavioral norms are those norms that are established by rules, laws, procedures. They come down from the top. Informal behavioral norms are laws that are established by cultural pattern. Uh, you know, there's a doormat at the door, so you wipe their feet. You're not, there's no doormat, you don't wipe your feet. Um, the kind of environment in its totality, those are informal behavioral norms. Now, I want to actually, we're going to make sure you guys get it, and we're going to let you move a little bit. I want everybody in this room to put your hand on your head. Put your hand on your head. Very good. People in the back, hand on your head. Thank you. That is a formal behavioral norm. By, by, per, by virtue of my position on the stage, I'm the boss. I told you to put your hand on your head, and you did. But you're not going to keep doing it unless I keep telling you. Formal behavioral norms are incredibly easy to establish. It took me no effort at all to just say that, but really hard to enforce. Informal behavioral norms are much easier, much harder to establish, but much easier to enforce. Can I get you to come up here and volunteer? OK, so no, no, right here. So what's your name? Suzette. Suzette, it's really nice to meet nice you. To meet Thank you. you. You can sit down. Um, she shook my hand. I didn't tell her to shake my hand. She'll do it again and again and again. All of you will do it. It is an informal behavioral norm enforced by our culture, right? So very, very easy. I don't have to enforce it. I don't have to tell her. I don't have to dock her paycheck because she didn't do it. Um, we've established that. And so in order to design experience, what we want to do is we really want to focus on creating the environments that will allow us to produce those informal behavioral norms. Now, why does that matter? Well, if you look at the bottom of this slide, see this little word down here? I don't know if you can see it in the back. It's culture, right? And unless you've been sleeping for the past five years, you know that culture has become critical to business. There's a great Peter Drucker saying, I love this. He says, uh, Culture eats strategy for breakfast, 
right? And uh, you know, it's just it's just so true. And so what those informal behavioral norms is they become your culture and they help you to attract and retain the employees you want. They help those employees to get the work done that you need done. All right. So, and it's particularly critical today as we move into a, um, an employee-centric uh, uh, world where the behavior of millennials and technology are completely changing the workplace. Um, I love this slide. The old command and control methods of management simply do not work with younger workers. Um, they're bringing their own behaviors to the future of work, and that's a whole other lecture. <laughs> that somebody else will give. Um, but uh, it, it, here's one example that basically if baby boomers don't like something, they will complain. If millennials don't like something, they leave. And what does that do to your workforce? So um, what I'm going to, so, so how do we do this? Well, the first thing is really to design the experience. And that is a, that is a business strategy, a C-level discussion. What is your business strategy, value proposition, brand, and what is the experience that is going to make that, make that strategy happen? And then once you've actually got that, that's the experience we want, then basically you have three levers to make it happen. That's it, just three, right? One is your organizational structure, your hierarchy, your reporting relationships, team size, job descriptions. Um, the second is programs and amenities, and with apologies to the IT people, I always throw technology tools into this category. They want their own lever. I want three. Um, so benefits, events, free food in the kitchen, your retirement plan, all that kind of thing. And then facilities, the layout, the looks, the functionality. Now, what's interesting about these three levers is that CEOs have known for a long time that organizational structure will do it. And HR departments and IT have known for a long time that programs and amenities will do it. And facilities people have known for a long time that facilities will do it. But what happens is when you focus on behavior and everyone's trying to drive the same behavior, you can get those people moving all together. And I think relative to the uh, last question that was asked last time, it's not so much getting the facilities out of the room, it's getting the other people in the room so that facilities is sitting at the decision-making table as these discussions are happening. And we have all of these things happening at the same time so we can get those levers aligned and make things happen. All right, so I'm going to show you now. I'm going to talk about one uh, kind of just one piece of behavioral research and show you a, a case study um, that admittedly is, uh, uh, anyway, I'll get to that. <laughs> um, I'm going to show you one piece of research, a case study to how that applies how that might apply. Um, and then I'm going to get into a few other examples and ask you to do some thinking, that whole professor thing. i got to make you do some work. Um, so there is a lot of behavioral research on, on group size and the power of group size. And what we know from that research is that a group that is less than, let's say, six to eight people has a really high level of trust. Um, walking right in the door. They tend to be more prone to activity, um, action. Um, they tend to tolerate dissent a little bit better. Um, and they tend to uh, bond more quickly. So if your company happens to be less than six people or eight people, that's fantastic, right? But as soon as you're bigger than six or eight people, you begin to lose that. As soon as I'm at the ninth person, the tenth person, all of a sudden somebody has to be the boss. I end up with office politics. Um, people are more likely to be silent when they actually know things that the group needs to know. So how do you do this? Well, research actually shows that if we have a group of six to eight, and then we combine those groups into roughly 24, and then we combine those 24 into roughly 150, which is Dunbar's number, which is the, I don't care if you have 500 LinkedIn contacts, you really can only keep track of about 150 that you really know. Um, then suddenly we find that that group of 150 is more prone to action and trusts better. And there's all kinds of benefits that actually come because the core of that group of 150 are these smaller groups of six to eight. So it takes a little bit longer to set up, but it seems to have that effect. So anyway, so now I want to take you, I want to actually show you this and a few other things in action. Um, uh, in, in this audience, these, uh, the images that I'm eventually going to get to are going to look old fashioned, because gosh darn it, it was 2008 when this was actually built. Um, but that allowed me to get five years of data so that we could really look at results. OK, so um, I can't tell you the name of the company, because they're right in the middle of being purchased, and they didn't want me to 
talk about them. So this is a company that shall remain nameless. Uh, they, scale, they sell skin care products. And their business model is this. They have a bunch of people on phones who are selling training to use the products to dermatologists and estheticians um, who are then reselling the product to the end user. Right? And so um, when I, um, what, I, what I actually do for a living is I go in and I teach business leaders across those three. So I teach CEOs, HR departments, IT people, facilities people. I teach them about this behavioral stuff and then I engage them so that they can solve the problem because they know their business far better than me. Um, so I facilitate those things. So I went in and I worked with PCA Skin and through that they really figured out that the core of their business, the place their customers touched, was the, um, is, that, is that call center. But it's a call center, for God's sake. Who wants to work in a call center? They had attraction and retention problems. Um, some of their call center people had used to be estheticians. Some of them used to be nurses, highly, highly knowledgeable. Some of them were hired and they had a binder they could look up. You know, ooh, that person's face is turning red when you put the stuff on. I wonder what's going on. You know, so, so it was a little bit, little bit rough for their customer. Um, so we needed to level that out. But mostly they needed to hang on to their people. They would get good people. They would invest in training. And then their people would disappear on them. So the first thing that we did um, was take a look at, this, at the physical situation. They were sitting in high-walled cubicles. They were assigned breaks based on who got hired next. Um, and we took those, uh, that kind of diverse array of people and we put them into groups of eight. Um, and then we made that group of eight has a single break at the same time. Uh, research actually shows the top, among the top 10 list of reasons that people stay at their job on almost every single survey that you look at, one of those top 10 reasons is I have a friend at work, right? So all these people are now taking a break together. They have an opportunity to have a friend at work. We fixed up their break room, which used to look like a typical office kitchen. Nobody ate there. They went out to eat or ate in their car. <laughs> so now it's a lovely place. It has free food in it. They stay. They make friends. So, and this is actually what this looks like in place, right? So it's actually still a cubicle system. It was a pretty conservative company. They didn't want to go more open than that. But you can see that the exterior wall of the group is higher. The interior walls are lower or non-existent. People can sit in their chair. They can turn into the corner where the sound, more soundproofing is to talk on the phone. They can spin around and say, that's not my area of expertise. I'm going to hand you over to Susan, who was an esthetician for 10 years before she started working with us. Now, it has been shown that sales increase when you actually introduce someone as being an expert. right? So now we've got some training, so the sales are happening higher. So the physical layout creates the group. The lowered panels allowed for people to see and hear each other. Um, we also changed the compensation. So now they get bonus not only on their own sales, but they get bonus on the sales of the group. So now they're working as a group. Um, we gave them a common break area for social connection. And then every three months, they change seats within their group. So you're sitting next to someone different. Um, now, the results of this right now, so notice that this is not just facilities. This is all of those things, right? All three of those levers. Here's the results. For, uh, measured after five years, I don't have the 2013 numbers yet. Um, employees increased 32%, which allowed them to increase their revenue by 78.9%, and the training time is down by 31.5%. Facilities did not do that alone, but it contributed. And if I get all three of those levers going, this is the kind of results that you get. All right, so really quickly, I'm going to just talk about three things, and then I'm going to assign it to you. OK, so motivation research, which is uh, in psychology is known as drive research, uh, clearly shows that we perform better together. So think about your sales team um, right, and the scoreboard. Um, and we learn better alone. Okay? Territoriality, everyone who's yanking people out of their cubicles is dealing with this. Territoriality research. Um, indicates that the real driver is not the need to own physical space. The real driver is to remove threat. So think about are there other ways that you could actually remove threat, that you could give someone comfort that their job was continuing, that their livelihood was continuing, that their social status was continuing. Innovation. A lot of discussions about innovation and diversity. There's a great book, um, Scott, actually Scott Page um, from Michigan, a researcher from Michigan has actually done a lot of uh, research on diversity and the power of diversity and innovation. But what people don't always talk about is it's not the diversity that's important. It's the importance of the minority dissenting opinion, that somebody who has a different opinion, who's coming from a different angle, understands that they can speak, right? And that they're empowered to speak. So how do you, how do you empower minority dissenting opinion? OK, so what I really quickly want to do I have like three minutes, is to, <laughs> sorry, is to have each of you um, kind of 
quickly at your table, pick one of these, motivation, territory, or descent, and one of these, organizational structure, program amenities, and facilities, and uh, design it. P think of an idea. Think of an idea that will allow you, what kind of organizational structure would uh, address this issue of the perform and learn discrepancies? What kind of program and amenity might uh, address the issue of territory? What kind of facility move might address the issue of dissent? One, two, three, go. You have three minutes. Talk. What my challenge to you as you go back is I, what I want you to do is I really do want you to focus on, um, to focus on designing the experience um, and to really think about what behaviors are going to get you to that experience. So the next time someone comes to you and says, I need a conference room, I want you to wait, just kind of go, you know, before you respond to it by giving them a conference room, I want you to start by asking them, what is the conversation that you need to have happen? Because if you understand that conversation, what kind of conversation it is, who should be participating in that conversation, you will be able to discern whether or not they actually need a conference room. Maybe they need a lounge. Maybe they need a space in a co-working space across town. right? So if you really look at what's the experience, What's the behavior that makes that experience happening? And then address the object so that we are no longer in an era of discussing objects. We're really in an era of discussing experiences. So my challenge to you to go forth is design the experience and then make it real. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Christine.